Good evening, everyone. I am Pastor Tina Carragher, and I just want to welcome you to the 2021 Virtual Week of Prayer and Revival for South Central Conference. I am so glad that you are tuning in on this evening, and I hope that you're going to tune in every evening. Now, the theme for this week of prayer and revival is Maranatha, and to tell us more about this theme is none other than our conference president, Elder Benjamin Jones. Good evening. Say to all our South Central family, we're so glad that you are with us. Later this, early this summer, I, I was praying about what we are all going through over the last several months. This has been a difficult time. We've had losses and problems and issues. And the Lord impressed me that we need to come aside as a conference and spend some time in prayer and focus. And so I remember the old days when we used to have a fall week of prayer every November. And so we're having a fall week of prayer this time virtually. I wish we could all be in the same place. But I I was reading Revelation and remembered again what the closing cry was, even so come Lord Jesus. And so our theme, Maranatha, come soon Lord, it was impressed upon our heart. The main focus that makes us Adventist is that we're looking for the soon coming of the Lord. And if anything, this pandemic has impressed us that we're anxious for the Lord to come. So during this week, we'll hear great preaching. During this week, we'll talk about prayer. During this week, we'll talk about the impact and preparation for that coming. And I'm praying that the Lord will bless those of us who are a part of this piece. I want to say to you, take this time and this week to do some private stuff between you and God. Not only listen to the preaching, but ask God for direction. You know, the devil wants us to be depressed and discouraged, but I want to say the devil is a lie. So this week, the Lord's going to change some lives across this conference that's going to close out 2021 with a tremendous energy and prepare us to do great work in 2022. So I'm, we're praying together and we're asking God to bless. And I'm asking you to share these links and share this week of prayer with your loved ones, with your friends. So I want to begin this, this series this evening with prayer. Loving Lord, I'm thankful that you have blessed us with your word and with the Holy Spirit. I'm asking, Lord, as we begin this virtual week of prayer, as we are looking for the soon coming of the Savior, that we will have an urgency for a spiritual awakening in our own lives. As we pour our hearts out to you, Lord, may your presence be evident in our lives. Bless every home bless every family. And as we deal with specific issues, we want to be ready when you come. So Lord, as the preachers preach, as the music goes out, as we turn our hearts toward heaven, you would use us to bless others. And I thank you in advance, Lord, beginning with the night, with the powerful impact the Spirit will do as he uses Dr. Nixon and then others through the week to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. You be blessed. As we start this, we can pray together. together with one agenda and it is you alone one agenda and it is you alone one agenda and it is you alone even so Jesus Christ. 
Thank you so much for rejoining us. And before I get into the introduction of speaker, I just want to express my apologies, you know, for the technical difficulties that we experienced for a few minutes. You know, anytime that you're seeking to do the Lord's work and the Lord's will, there is always going to be opposition. But thankfully and prayerfully, and thank you for praying for us as we regroup, but thankfully and prayerfully, there will be no more interruptions on this evening now our speaker for tonight really needs no introduction but i'm going to introduce him anyways just in case you don't happen to know who he is our speaker for this evening is one of the most transformational leaders in seventh day adventism he is a pastor he is a preacher he is a teacher he is a husband he is a father and even more than that, Dr. John Nixon Sr. is a man of God. He's also our executive secretary of the South Central Conference. So after we have our musical selection, the next voice that you're going to be hearing will be that of Dr. John Nixon Sr. Hear ye him. I love you, Lord. 
darkest hours you were there like no other I've known you as a father and I've known you as a friend and I will sing of the goodness of God for all my life you have been faithful So, so God, with every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are looking now for your spirit to come to us and speak words that only God can speak. We open our hearts and ask you to touch us. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, Adventist Review published an article that was built basically around a conversation between two Adventist teams. They were talking about the second coming of Christ, and it was most unusual. The title of the article will tell you everything. The, the article was titled, The Second Coming, It's Not Fair. The young lady expressed her feelings about the second coming of Christ, and she said that if Jesus comes soon, it's not fair to her. Let me quote from the article. Quote, I want him to come back, just not now not in my lifetime because I want to live my life. I want to get married and have kids. 
If God comes now or in the next 10 years, I'm going to miss out on all of that. My parents got to get married and live life, so of course they're ready for God to come. But I haven't done that yet. Doesn't God want me to be happy? It's astounding when you think about it. It's shocking to think that any Christian, especially one who believes in the second coming of Christ, might think that way. What a thing for a believer to say, to hope for, that Jesus should delay his return so she can be happy. There's so many implications there, they could just explode your brain. If nothing else, shouldn't Adventists care about what's going on in the rest of the world while we wait for Christ's return? There are 40 wars being waged right now in our world involving 174 countries. Five of them, these wars, have had 10,000 dead in the last year. That's 50,000 dead people, one year. What about human trafficking? Human trafficking has become a $150 billion a year business with more than 110,000 known victims in one year. 71% women and girls sexually exploited. Should that go on for 10 more years? And what about our fellow Christians in other countries who serve God under the threat of death? Sneaking Bibles, worshiping in secret, languishing in prison or sacrificing their lives for the sake, for the, uh, sake of the faith. What about them? Must these things continue for another 10, 20, 30 years so that one American teen can get married and have kids? You better hurry up. The rest of us are waiting for Jesus. And what about her children? Won't they want to get married and have kids too? Startling. It's a shocking article. But before we are too hard on her, I want us to think back, step back, and think about ourselves. It is no easy thing to live spiritual lives in a natural realm. We're bodily creatures, not spirits. Living every day based on things we can't even see and often can't understand. It's no easy thing. And compound that with the fact of living in the land of opportunity where there's always another ambition, another thing to aspire to, another achievement to pursue, another point of pride to display, to keep us rooted and grounded down here instead of rooted and grounded in Christ. That's the reality of our world. It's no easy thing. It's easy to get attached to this world and stop longing for the next world and fall into the self-indulgent and self-defensive life of trying to find our happiness here by every means possible. So believers, I want to talk to us for a moment about the dangers of this world living and the solution to it all that is found in Jesus Christ. Under this title, Jesus is coming, but do we want him back? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 4 to begin. The Bible says, dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, this is first thing, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our father, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of the creation. The NLT has it. What happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? What happened to the promise? As Peter pens this particular throughout Asia Minor, 
He knows he's soon to die. This will be his last letter. It's been 30 years since the ascension of Christ. And all this time, Peter has been doing what the Lord commanded him to do when he restored him after the res resurrection. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And then he said, feed my sheep. That's what Peter's been doing, feeding the sheep. The Christian church is still, and it's under attack now by Rome. Nero is on the throne. And Christians are hated by the empire. They call them atheists because they don't worship the Roman gods. They call them cannibals because they eat the body and drink the blood of Christ. They call them incestuous because they're always saying, I love your brother, I love your sister. They're hated, they're despised, they're feared in Rome. The believers have little of this world's goods and are constantly under threat. All they have is their hope and the soon return of their Lord. And now some among them are even trying to take that away. Where is this coming, they say. Peter comes to the rescue. He calls them scoffers, mockers, he says. A scoffer is someone who, not, not someone who is puzzled or who has honest questions or even afraid. All these frames of mind may still be evidence of a believer whose faith has grown weak or who's become tired. That's not scoffing. That's not mocking the truth. A scoffer is a kind of persecutor attacking the church from the inside with ridicule and discouragement and even outright lies. Peter has no sympathy for them. In fact, he talks about them throughout his letter in terms that are anything other than complimentary. In chapter 1, he calls them false teachers who twist the scriptures. In chapter 2, they bring the cause of Christ into disrepute, he says. Again, in 2, he calls them covetous and exploitative, preying on the weak. Then he says, they distort liberty and turn it into license. In other words, they teach grace as an excuse for sin. They don't teach freedom from sin. They teach freedom to sin. Paul, uh, Peter says they're disreputable. They bring, they bring uh, the, the cause of Christ to shame, and they twist the scriptures. He has no sympathy for them. And now, now they're scoffing about the second coming, wreaking havoc. They're not sincere. Peter says they deliberately forget. That's not the same as not remembering. That's remembering and then choosing not to remember. They deliberately forget. Hardening the heart. Choosing not to believe. Scoffers, mockers, he calls them. Mocking means to treat with contempt or ridicule. To mimic or imitate insincerely. He calls them mockers. When the people of Noah's time laughed at his art, and mimicked his preaching like a silly old man. They were mocking God's man and God's word. When Lot's sons-in-law laughed him to scorn, when he warned them that the destroying angel had come to Sodom, they were scoffing. In both cases, the mockers and the scoffers saw they were wrong, but by the time they did, it was too late. Their unbelief costed them, and it costed them everything. So Peter doesn't address them in his letter. He talks about them, but not to them. For they have hardened their hearts. But he does have a message to share to the believers. His letter's for believers who've been waiting and starting to get tired, maybe a little doubtful, maybe a little discouraged. His letter is to the believers. We've been waiting too, beloved, you and me. We've been waiting a long time. We've been talking about this second coming thing for years, for decades. In fact, do you realize that every generation of Christians since the first century expected Christ to return in their lifetime? And here we are, expecting him in ours. How long is it going to be? Is the promise a mistake? I want to look at the word with you tonight to strengthen your faith, to reignite your fire to encourage you on to mission and ministry and saving souls, getting people ready to meet Jesus in peace. Jesus is coming. I know he's coming, and I want to be ready when he comes. So after scoffing at the scoffers, 
Peter begins to address the havoc that they've caused by their accusations against God. And that's what they've done. They've caused havoc. Where is this coming? He promised, they say. So Peter takes them on. 2 Peter 3, 8, he says, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Peter stirs up our thoughts to think on another level, a spiritual level. For us, there's a vast difference between a day and a thousand years, but not for God. For God, there's no difference at all. All things past, present, and future are open to him as one indivisible present and therefore ever at his disposal. A day like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day before God. So, so putting off something for a day for us would be like putting off something for a thousand years for God. To him the same. And so in other words, we cannot judge him by our human experience. When we say delay, when we say too long, we're not even talking his language. Because to him, a day is a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. Remember, in John 16, Jesus was explaining to his disciples how the Holy Spirit was going to come and take up his work. He makes a statement there, John 16, that in one sentence shows the difference between the way he reckons time and the way we reckon time. John 16, 16. Listen to this. Jesus said, in a little while, you will see me no more. Then after a little while, you will see me. In a little while, you'll see me a little while. Then he says, after a little while, you will see me. The exact same word in both sentences, micron in the Greek. Like micro, micron, a little while. Now for us, the two time periods Jesus calls a little while are vastly different from each other. The first little while refers to the ascension, when Christ goes back to the Father to present his blood on our behalf. That's just a few days away when he makes this statement, the ascension after the resurrection. There he is even right now pleading for us his shed blood, bless his name. But the second little while, we don't know how that could be a little while as well, because the second little while is the time between his ascension and the second coming, and we're still waiting for that little while. But to Christ, they're the same. They're like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. In other words, delay is a human conception. There is no such thing as delay with God. Here's Charles Ellicott. His thoughts are not as our thoughts, nor his ways our ways. What seems delay to us is none to him. God's relationship with time is totally different from ours. God is eternal in his being, the timeless one. He is not a God who is in time, spread out from the past to the future, as we sometimes conceptualize it. But rather, he is the God who is outside the stream of time altogether, unaffected by its movements. God does not have a past and a future. He does not live from moment to moment as we do, waiting to see what will happen next. God is outside of time, watching it pass, while he, unaffected by it, controls the issues of the universe and of this world. C.S. Lewis tried to illustrate it in his book, Mere Christianity. He talks about this story of an author who was at work at his desk writing a novel. And in the novel, he's writing about his heroine. Mary is standing on a street corner when all of a sudden a shadowy figure starts to come up behind her as she's standing there. And at that moment, the doorbell rings. And the writer goes to answer the door, puts his pen down. His friends have arrived. He brings them and entertains them, spends time with them. They leave. And then he goes back to his writing, back to his desk. And what has happened to Mary while he was gone? Well, nothing's happened to Mary. Because he's the writer. He's not affected by the imaginary time of his book. He stands outside that experience. He can make time go backward if he wants to. In the same way, God is not in the stream of time with us. He's not walking minute by minute like we do. 
He doesn't have to pass through 10.50 to get to 10.51 p.m. We can't judge God by our clocks and calendars. He's the one who decides time, not the other way around. Time is his creation, not his master. And nobody knows his times or seasons. Nobody knows the day or hour. It is not for us to know. Our part is to believe the promise and be faithful while we wait. That's Peter's message to the believers scattered all through Asia Minor. That's the Bible's message to us. I know Jesus is coming. I just want to be ready when he comes. They're like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. That's what Peter says. Then he goes on. Verse 9, another point. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord, the Lord is not slack, Peter says. All this complaining from the scoffers, when all along Jesus hasn't come yet for their sake, so they have time to get their faith together. What they call slackness, God calls long-suffering. What seems like a delay to them is God being merciful to them, giving more time so that all can be saved who can be saved? Think about it for a minute. Think for this, about this designation, long-suffering. God calls himself long-suffering. Not slack, long-suffering. Long-suffering toward us. Some of the Bible translations say patience. But long-suffering is more than just patience. It's patience of a particular kind. God suffers while we wait. Suffering with the suffering of the world. Those wars, those, those, that violence that we talked about. God feel, God's experiencing that with us as we go through it. He's suffering with the suffering of the world. Jesus is brokenhearted as he watches us falling apart down here. With disease and disaster and violence and betrayal. And the worst of all of our sins, man's inhumanity to man. The worst of our sins. The things we do to each other, it breaks the heart of our Lord. He suffers while he waits for the right time to return. And the time is determined by the time when he can get the maximum out of salvation. When the most who can be saved can be saved, then Jesus comes. He's waiting for our benefit. And he suffers while he waits. Remember the parable of the wheat and the tares, Matthew 13? Jesus told the story. The farmer plants wheat, good seed, wheat in the field. Overnight, while everybody's sleeping, an enemy comes in and plants weeds mixed in with the wheat. And the two start growing, and the weeds start to try to choke the wheat. And then a moment comes, this is Matthew 13, 28, 29, where the, the um, servants come to the master. And they say to him, should we pull out the weeds, they ask. No, he replied, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. Get this part. Let them grow together until the harvest. Let them grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weed, put them into bundles and burn them, and put the wheat in my barn. Let them grow together till the harvest. That's what Christ is waiting for, the time of maximum salvation, when the wheat and weeds can be separated and the wheat gathered into the barn while the weeds are destroyed. Don't you see? Jesus waits. He's not waiting because he has other things to do first. He's not waiting because he's forgotten about us. On the contrary, Jesus is waiting because he's thinking of us. He's waiting for the complete ripening so that as many can be saved, will be saved. He's waiting for our benefit, and we should in turn, should we accuse him of breaking his promise? Should we blame him for the sin that continues to haunt our world when we ourselves are contributing to that sin every day? Should we point the finger at Jesus because we don't understand everything? God forbid. Our part is not to question our Lord's timing. Our part is to believe the promise and be faithful while we wait. 
I know Jesus is coming. I just want to be ready when he comes. Oh, Lord, please don't leave here without me. I just want to be ready when he comes. One commentator has this to say about how we as believers combine faith and waiting. He put it this way. Let a humble and diligent walking before God, and get this, a frequent judging of ourselves, show a firm belief in the future. A diligent walking before God, and get this part, frequently judging ourselves. Do you hear that? We show faith in the promise of Christ's return not by scoffing and not by judging others. We show it by watching, waiting, and all the while assessing ourselves, measuring ourselves, judging ourselves to see if we're being faithful while we wait. That's how we show faith in the promise. Not by predicting it's going to happen here, it's going to happen there. No, by judging ourselves while we wait, faithfully following diligently our Lord. That's how a believer waits without losing hope. The Bible tells us not to judge others, but it implores us to judge ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Lamentations 3, 40, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. And then Psalm 119, 59, I've considered my ways and I've turned my steps to your statutes. Self-judging leading to repentance. That's what the Bible's teaching us. And we have come full circle, back to the beginning. Do we really want Jesus to come, or we, would we prefer that he wait a while till we get some things done down here? When we compare the prosperity of black Americans with that of white Americans, many disparities appear, including what they call the huge, the wealth gap. But when you compare, compare black American pro prosperity in the past with prosperity in the present, it's a different story. In 1964, there were five black members of Congress. In 2020, there are 56 black members of Congress, including 12% of the House of Representatives. And an African American has been in the White House. How about education? Between 1990 and 2018, black college graduation has more than doubled. Between 2000 and 2017, Black college enrollment has soared to an all-time high. Here's something I didn't know. The percentage of black women in college is greater than the percentage of white men in college. Sisters are getting schooled. What about black wealth? In 1980, the median household wealth in the black family was $30,000. 2017, 41,000. Not much of a, an increase, just about half of what whites get. But what about super wealth? See, in a nation like ours where the income gap is so big, the way you measure wealth is also you have to look at the super wealthy as well. What about super wealth? I was shocked to learn, and I, had, I read three sources, that in 2020, there were 1,790,000 black millionaires in America. I checked three sources. 1,790,000 black millionaires in America and seven black billionaires. You know the names. Oprah, Kanye, Tyler, Jay-Z, Jordan, billionaires. We may not be rich, but we identify with their wealth as if they were family. And hear me now. With every advancement and every gain, with every achievement and every elevation, we're in danger of becoming more and more comfortable down here, more and more attached to the things of this world. The more we get, the more we want. The less we surrender ourselves, the less we give up, and the less we want Jesus to come and put an end to it all. Because when he comes, he's going to put an end to all of it. It all has to go when he comes. So we're tempted to say, Girl, in the beginning, come Lord Jesus, but not now. The Bible says, examine yourself. Search your heart. 
What is your second coming faith looking like? Peter winds it up, verses 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of our Lord. It is our calling. Waiting for, and not asking Jesus to put the brakes on, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. That's where we stand. We're not scoffers. We're not the mockers. We're not unbelievers. I know Jesus is coming. I just want to be ready when he comes. And you know what else? I want you to be ready. Ready when he comes. Lover, don't you see the waiting time is not about God? The waiting time is about us. It's a time for heart rending and soul searching. It's a time to level up our faith, to make sure nothing is stealing away our hope. It's a time to renew our surrender to Jesus, not to the world, making sure with minute self-examination that our hearts have not become attached to the wrong things. Jesus said, set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. He didn't say not the sinful things of the earth. He just said not the things of the earth. Set your affections on things above. It's heart-rending, soul-searching time as we wait faithfully for the return of our Lord. I know Jesus is coming. Me, I just want to be. Let me close with this. There was a famous long distance runner back in the 80s by the name of Jim Fix. He authored a best selling book in 1984, The Complete Book of Running, it was called. He's the one credited with starting America's running craze. He himself ran 80 miles every week. This being the case, there's some kind of a cruel irony to the way he lost his life. One day, Jim Fix, the original running man, one day in July of 84, he was running one of his regular routes on Route 15 in Hardwick, Vermont. While he was running, suddenly he suffered a massive heart attack dropped to the ground, and died right there in the street. And no warning. There were no chest pains, no shortness of breath. It was a case of sudden death out of nowhere. It was discovered in the postmortem that Jim Fix had an arterial heart disease that had never been diagnosed. Atherosclerosis had blocked one artery 95% a second artery, 85%, and a third artery, 70%. His heart was a ticking time bomb, and it finally went off. His wife said he refused to have regular checkups. Even though heart disease ran in his family, he refused to have regular checkups. He was deceived by his overall physical health. He thought he was safe, so he didn't even get checked out. Beloved, heart disease runs in our family too. The whole head, the whole heart is sick. We're born that way. Then we come to Jesus and he steps in to rule the heart. He changes our lives. Just wait till I get back. But the time lags. Things happen in life. People die. Year after year goes by. Nothing changes and we start to think, Well, did we get it wrong? Just be faithful, and in the meanwhile, check out your heart. Get a checkup. Make sure you stand where you think you stand. Make sure you are who you think you are. That's what the waiting time is for. Not to mock, not to scoff. The waiting time is self-examination time. 
We want to be ready when he comes. I know Jesus is coming. I just want to be ready. What about you? So here's this word now hanging out there. Holy Spirit is He's placed it in your heart. Right now, a voice is speaking to you, telling you what you right now to make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ in the light of this word. And say to him, Lord, I've been distracted by many things, but today I want to focus on the one thing. And Lord, that's you. So I give you my heart today. I confess my sins. And I ask you to take over my life. You make that decision today. You can do it right now. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to come to the altar. You can do it right now. In your heart, in your mind, between you and Jesus. I pray you will, Father in heaven. Oh, Lord, thank you for the delay, which is no delay to you. But thank you for the delay, because it gives us time to make sure our hearts are right. Father, today somebody hearing this word has said, Lord Jesus, I want a new life with you. I want to confess my sins and come to you. Father, I pray right now you will hear that prayer and answer it with a yes, as you promised to do. And then take that soul, place your spirit on them, and write their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, that's what you promised. I pray that prayer for that person right now in this moment. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What a powerful sermon from Dr. John Nixon Sr. Uh, perhaps you're feeling the same way that I'm feeling, and you are just moved. And I just I want to remind you that this week of prayer is not just another event. In fact, it's not an event at all. It's an invitation for you to be in a deeper, loving, saving relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There were so many gems from Dr. Nixon's sermon, but the one that I, the couple that I really wanna highlight that is, that is very important to why we are doing this week of prayer is that Jesus, he said, Jesus is waiting for the for maximum salvation. So yes, I know we are tired of, of all of these deaths due to COVID-19. I know that we're tired of politics. I know that we're tired of, of high gas prices. Can I get a witness? I know we're tired of so many things and we keep saying that we want Jesus to come. But the truth of the matter is that Jesus has delayed, as, the, as Pastor Nixon was saying, Jesus has delayed his coming because he's waiting on more people to decide for him. That, my friends, is the good news of the gospel, that he's not going to show up uh, hastily or too swiftly, but he's wanting to make sure that none is lost and that all that is possible can be saved. What a powerful message. So while you're grumbling about Jesus when he's coming back, as the pastor said, you want to make sure that even you are in right relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, tonight was just the first night. And again, we apologize for the technical difficulties. And we thank you for praying. And listen, keep praying. Because as the gospel is going forth, the devil is going to keep coming, trying to distract and disrupt uh, what we are trying to do through this week of prayer. Now, our week does not, uh, the, the preaching does not end. There's going to be more preaching and more singing this week. But I want to let you know that on tomorrow night at 7 p.m., the same spots, the South Central Conference Facebook page and the South Central Conference YouTube page and our website. Uh, our speaker for tomorrow night is going to be Pastor Bon Zeal. So you want to make sure that you tune in to hear tomorrow night's service. I promise you, you are going to be blessed. Listen. This concludes our service for tonight. I'm going to close with prayer. Father in heaven, God, we just want to thank you for the powerful message reminding us to be faithful while we wait. It's going to be tempting, God, for us to be caught up and consumed by a whole lot of things that are taking place in this world. But at the end of the day, you have asked for, you to, for your believers to be ready and to stay ready. So God, please help us to stay focused 
for your coming and your coming soon, but also help us to be faithful to do our parts to make sure that other people know that you love them and you gave your life to save them. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Join us as we sing this hymn. Watch ye saints with eyelids waiting. Lo, he comes. Yes, Jesus comes. Let's sing it together. Watch ye saints. Watch ye saints with eyelids waiting. Lo, the powers Lord, of heavens are shaking. Sinners come while Christ is pleading. Sinners, 